Well, we do welcome all of you who are uh, joining us online, as well as those of you uh, who have braved uh, the changing cold weather um, and have joined us here at Central Campus, as well as uh, others of you who are joining together at one of our other campuses in Airdrie, Bridgeland, uh, South Calgary, and at Bear Spa. If you're visiting with us today, uh, or you're relatively new to our church, I, I want you to know that typically once a year I give a state of the church address in which I focus on what God has been doing in and through us as a church and where we believe that God is leading us as a church. Uh, the focus in this particular address is going to be a bit different. And the reason for that is, is because as I pointed out last week in point one, uh, a part one rather, my sense is that the negative fallout of COVID, the political and cultural polarization that we are experiencing, the war in Ukraine, and the real possibility of World War III have left many people in a heightened state of fear and uncertainty, unsure of who to believe, uh, who to trust in, and these people are genuinely uh, seeking direction in life. And I believe this opens a door for us as Christians to introduce these people to Jesus, the solid rock upon which we stand and in whom we find peace and joy in the midst of all of the craziness that's going on around us. However, that's going to require, first and most importantly, that we pray, that we be a people of prayer, and that we keep our eyes on Jesus and his calling for our lives, which is the focus of this year's address, uh, to remind us what it is that Christ calls us to give our lives to. In Matthew chapter 22, a religious leader approached Jesus and asked, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then if you look over in John chapter 13, Jesus is meeting with his disciples. He has just washed their feet. He is very close to being arrested and ultimately going to the cross. And he turns to his disciples and he says, a new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, in these scriptures, Jesus is essentially saying, if you are my disciple, the greatest priority you will give your life to is to love God, to love one another, and to love others to Jesus. Now, Satan, the great deceiver, will do everything he can to get us off script. And my observation is that during COVID, he has been working overtime to get us to take our eyes off Jesus and to keep us distant from God rather than loving God, to divide us as Christians instead of loving one another, and to distract us from our God-given mission of loving others to Jesus. These are what I call Satan's 3D wish list for you and me, to bring us to a point of distance from God, to divide us as Christians, and to distract us from our mission. Now last week, I talked about ways I believe Satan is tempting us ever so subtly to be distant from God. And if you weren't able to take that message in, I encourage you to do so. You go on our website, look under sermons, and you will find it. Now, in this message, I'm going to talk about ways that I believe Satan is tempting us to be divided as Christians and to be distracted from our God-given mission. In one of his final prayers before facing the cross in John 17, Jesus prayed to his heavenly Father that he would protect his church from disunity and division. This is what he said in verse 11 of John 17. Holy Father, 
protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Now, sadly, one of the great fallouts of the pandemic has been disunity and division in our nation, but also in our church. All the way down to division in small groups, in friendships, and in families. And this has happened across the entire nation, and I would dare say around the world. If there's one thing that COVID has taught us, it's how fragile unity is and how quickly even long-term relationships can be fractured and the church community crippled. Achieving and maintaining unity is hard, but it really matters to Jesus, friends. It really matters to him. And so it must matter to us. Now, the reality is unity doesn't come naturally. Division comes naturally. What's in it for me comes naturally. Having my way comes naturally. Blaming others comes naturally. Demanding my rights comes naturally. Canceling someone that I don't agree with comes naturally. Negative gossip, manipulation, a critical spirit comes naturally. Shaming, stereotyping, labeling, demonizing others comes naturally. Criticizing and complaining about something from a distance or something you know little about or have little involvement in, that comes naturally. Honoring people, giving them the benefit of the doubt does not come naturally. But you see, division comes naturally. We don't have to try very hard to end up there. Achieving unity, on the other hand, is incredibly hard because, you see, we're sinful, self-centered, and broken people. Unity requires humility. It requires involvement and intentionality. It requires forgiveness and grace. It requires discipline and sacrifice, and these do not come naturally. But it's mission critical. We cannot accomplish the mission God has called us to without unity. When we love one another and our focus is on Jesus and we live in unity, others around us notice. And in some cases, they're drawn not only to us, but the Jesus who is in us. When we're divided, when we treat each other in unloving and disrespectful ways, well then, we're just like everybody else. All that to say this, even though I don't want to minimize the fact that the majority of our nation and polls are showing this, do not have fond feelings about us as Christians, and in many cases are increasingly seeing us as their enemy. The true enemy of the church is not those who dislike us or those who disagree with us or have even canceled us. The real enemy of the church and of God's kingdom is division among us as believers. Now, as I pointed out earlier, in John chapter 13, 34, Jesus gave his disciples a new commandment. And he basically said, this commandment I'm giving you, this new commandment, this defines, this characterizes the new kingdom, the new covenant. And he said, a new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, did you get that? How we treat one another, how we talk to one another, how we talk about one another, how we respond to one another, how we pray and care for one another is the identifying mark of a genuine Christ follower. He said it's the litmus test 
of our devotion to him. Jesus said, the greatest indicator that you're my disciple is not what you believe, as important as that is. No, what identifies you as my disciple and impacts our ungodly culture the most is how we live out what we believe to be true. Theologian Don Carson writes, I suspect that one of the reasons there are so many exhortations in the New Testament for Christians to love other Christians is because this is not an easy thing to do. I mean, think of the early church. We often read about the early church, but do you ever think about the fact that, m- that the early church was mostly made up of people who were natural enemies rather than natural friends? The church was made up of classes of people who tended to despise each other like the rich and the poor. It was made up of slave owners and slaves. Again, not exactly the best of friends. It was made up of Jews and Gentiles, two ethnic groups who were taught from a young age that the other was their enemy. And let me tell you, these were not minor issues in that day. They were ingrained in ancient society. You know, down through the years, I've had people approach me, complain about their small group, and they would say something like, you know, I just don't have anything in common with the people in my group. I just don't click with them. They just aren't my kind of people. Or they would say, there is someone in my group you know, I can barely stand. Just totally irritates me. I need to find a different group. Now granted, sometimes a person is so emotionally unhealthy, they leave a wake of ruined relationships wherever it is they go. And they need help. They need healing before they can be part of a regular group. But most of the time, this isn't the issue. The person wants out simply because they find the other person sort of abrasive. They're looking for a small group where everyone just naturally likes each other. You know, no one has any issues. Everyone's so nice. Life is perfect. They're looking for heaven on earth is what they're looking for. Well, think about the dynamics that existed back in the early church. Imagine a Jew back there, a Jew worshiping next to a Gentile, and the negative thoughts that they would have had about the other, the different viewpoints and convictions they would have had about masks and vaccines. Oh, sorry, I forgot. I was talking about the first century church. But seriously, can you ima- can begin to appreciate how from a human point of view what Jesus was asking for here required nothing short of a miracle? I mean, the church working the way Jesus wants us to work is a miracle, folks. Imagine being a slave, coming to church or to your small group, And the first person you see is your slave owner who mistreated you, who looked down on you, and constantly spoke harshly to you. Now, of course, most likely the slave owner and the slave would have been transformed, would have had a change of heart and a change of mindset through Jesus Christ and their faith in him. But the memories would still be there, wouldn't they? Today, That would be like you showing up at church or your community group. And the first person you see is your former boss who was unkind to you, who embarrassed you in front of other co-workers, who didn't promote you and ultimately fired you. Of course, she too would have had a changed heart. But given the hurtful memories that you still have, would you be able to love that person now? Would you be able to forgive that person, worship alongside that person, pray with that person? Or would you just leave? This is too uncomfortable. I'm out of here. 
You see, the early Christians had only one thing in common, and that was Jesus. Their love for Jesus and being saved by the miraculous grace of Jesus, and that was all they needed to commit to learning to love. You see, we need to learn to love one another. This doesn't come naturally. But that's all they needed, was to learn to love one another, to say to one another, I may not like you, but I will love you the way that Jesus loves me, by being kind, by being caring and respectful to you. I may not agree with you on much of anything, but I won't let that define my relationship with you. I'll put these secondary issues aside. And I'm going to focus on the essential things that unite us in Christ. I'm going to focus on the scriptures. I'm going to focus on the mission that Christ has called us to. We're going to talk about how God's using us to try to introduce people to Jesus. And the challenges we have about that. I may hurt inside from the way that you rejected me, the way that you judged me, canceled me. But I choose to forgive you as Christ has forgiven me. I mean, think about it. What motivated? What possibly motivated the early believers to learn to love others in the church who had hurt them and who felt more like enemies to them than friends? It certainly wasn't because they wanted to. I believe there was only one reason they chose to love one another as Christ loved them. And that was their love for Jesus. Their devotion to Jesus. It was plain and simple obedience to Jesus who had saved them by his grace. Philippians 2.3 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Loving others means even when you don't feel like it, you obey the Lord and you put the interests of others ahead of yourself. It means you humble yourself and you're considerate of other people's feelings, which means you don't always bring up secondary issues that they disagree with. And you tend to get into an argument about. On the flip side, it means you're patient with that person who just keeps bringing up issues you don't want to talk about and that you don't agree with. The reality is in every extended family, in every group, there's at least one difficult person that has quirks and annoying habits and opinions that challenge our patience. And by the way, if everyone in your group seems nice and normal, then you're, then you're the one that we're talking about, okay? <laughs> But seriously, in a loving church, there's no elitism. There's no snobbery. There's, there's no um, discrimination of any kind. There's a genuine humility that seeks to build bridges rather than division or walls. But make no mistake, learning to love others, it takes commitment. It takes hanging in there. It takes humility. It takes patience. And most importantly, it takes prayer. And none of this comes naturally. This is where you grow in your faith. When you step in and you say, I'm going to do what I don't feel like doing, but Lord, I'm going to trust you. You know, I've had a few difficult people in the many groups that I've been part of over the years, including groups that I've taken to Israel. Every group... There's one of those people every time. But you know, in each case, I knew I didn't have the ability to love that person in my own strength. And so I asked God to give me a supernatural love. I asked God to give me grace and patience for that person. 
And I can't explain it, but over time, as I hung in there, I grew to love and to appreciate that person in a way that I never thought I could. I remember sometimes I would think about it, it would just shock me, the transformation that had happened in my attitude toward that person. And I realized that that change of attitude uh, was not something that I did, but that the Spirit did in me. And you know, when I realized that, it just grew my faith in the Lord that, that if I gave this person in this situation, if I just surrendered it to him in prayer, I would receive a supernatural love from the Lord for someone that I just struggled loving. Francis Chan asks, does God really expect us to be close to people that we wouldn't choose to be friends with? He writes, it's natural to be close with family and friends you like, and it's unnatural to be with people who are not like you or who irritate you. But that's just the point, he says. Loving others, as Christ calls us to, isn't supposed to be natural. It's supposed to be supernatural. In Luke chapter 6, verse 32, Jesus said, If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. In this passage, Jesus is differentiating between human love and divine love. Human love is all about liking those who like you. It's about being nice to those who are nice to you. But Jesus says, loving those who love you, I mean, that's easy. He says, even ungodly, evil people like those who like them. But Jesus went on to say, but those of you who are my followers, you're different. Even when you don't feel like it, out of respect and loyalty and gratitude to Jesus Christ, you choose to, to love with a divine love. You choose to love people who you don't agree with. You choose to love people that you consider hard to love. In Jesus' kingdom, you may not like someone, but you love them anyways by treating them as if you did like them with respect, kindness, and sensitivity. You know, in Acts 2, we read that this is the way the early believers in the church loved one another. And it says they enjoyed the favor of all the people in the community. And not only that, it says the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Those who were saying, man, whatever you've got, I want that. So let me ask you, what's Jesus saying to you about this right now? Is there someone that you're having a hard time loving? Is there someone you need to forgive? Is there a fractured relationship that you need to deal with? We're going to circle back to that question at the end of the message. And so Jesus calls us first to love God. He calls us secondly to love one another. And thirdly, he calls us to love others. In other words, to join him in bringing all people in right relationship to himself. Now I remind you that God created you and me for a purpose. And that purpose at its core, and please listen carefully now, that purpose at its core is for you, is, uh, is, is not about your personal fulfillment. It's not about your comfort. It's not about your security or your satisfaction or sense of safety in life. No, he created us for himself. Not in the sense that we are his plaything but that in the same way that healthy parents love being in relationship with their children, so God wants to be in relationship with us. God created us for his purpose, but he also created us for a purpose, and that is to join him, as I said a number of times now, to bring his spiritually lost kids into right relationship with himself. 
parents, if you've ever experienced losing one of your children for more than a few moments in a crowded mall or some other venue, and you experienced how in that moment you would have done anything, you would have given anything, you would have turned the world upside down, you would have made a complete fool of yourself to get your child back. If you've experienced that, then you have just a little bit of an understanding, not only how much the Lord loves you and me, but how much, but how he feels about his spiritually lost kids and how passionate he is about his spiritually lost kids coming back home. And Luke 19.10 tells us this is the main reason that Jesus came. It says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And in John 20, verse 21, he turns to you and to me. And he says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. And so when we join him in this, we're involved in the most God-glorifying activity possible on the planet. Because nothing is closer to the heart of God than his spiritually lost kids coming home to him. And you see, this is why I believe that we are still, those of us who know Jesus and our relationship with Jesus, this is why I believe that we're still here on this planet and we're not in heaven. There's no other reason for us to be here. Because we can worship better than ever in heaven. We can be close to each other in community better than ever in heaven. We're here. to bring his spiritually lost kids home. Now here's the thing, in the same way that Satan wants to keep us distant from God and divided as Christians, he also wants to distract us from the mission God's called us to. And as I already touched on last time, Satan attempts to distract us in, any, uh, in one of many ways. He seeks to distract us by spending too much time on our smartphones and social media and or on our computers following conspiracy theories and or on our television sets watching Netflix, YouTube, sports and the like or chasing after earthly things like success, wealth, position, power, fame, possessions. In short, Satan tempts us, you see, to get our eyes off what is eternal and to get us focused on things that are temporary and aren't going to matter a whole lot in the end. The Bible repeatedly tells us that this life is fleeting, that it is but a heartbeat compared to the next life, which is eternal or forever and ever. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. While both the earthly realm and the eternal realm are real, they're important to God, This verse tells us that we are to focus primarily on the eternal realm, the spirit realm. Now, that doesn't mean we don't care about our life here on earth, uh, about taking care of ourselves, about our families, our jobs, uh, living this life to the full. It doesn't mean that we don't care about the war in Ukraine, about the agenda of the World Economic Forum or the agenda of other special interest groups or about government legislation that's increasingly targeting and eroding our rights and freedoms as citizens of this nation, not to mention as Christians. What this verse is saying is, even though these earthly matters are important and potentially life-altering, we must not let them sidetrack us from the eternal things of God. 
like the spiritual life and the souls of people around us who need the Lord. It also means as we deal with earthly concerns, whatever they are, and however upsetting they may be to us, we must not allow them to become so important and all-consuming in our lives that we take our eyes off Jesus or divide ourselves as Christians or that we tarnish our testimony by utilizing some of the same tactics employed by those who see Christians as their enemy. Make no mistake, I see the growing tidal wave of opposition that's mounting against Christians and the Christian church. I read the statistics and the polls just like you do. I'm not naive enough to think that persecution isn't coming and that a day may come when we do lose our religious freedoms and may suffer greatly for our faith. But here's the thing, we are fooling ourselves if we think we can stop it in our own human strength and ingenuity. Now, I know that sounds fatalistic. And I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't do what we can to slow it down. But given that the majority of Canadians, I estimate 65 to 70% of Canadians, they do not embrace the worldview that we have. Our voice and our vote will not be heard or even listened to. And we have seen that already in some of the issues that we have tried to make a difference in. Our only hope is that God moves and changes the minds and hearts of millions of people across this nation. And that will only come about through us devoting ourselves in a renewed way to prayer to surrendering ourselves and our fears to the Lord and keeping our eyes on Him and doing what He calls us to do. Again, let me be perfectly clear. If you feel led to fight for your rights and freedoms as a Canadian citizen, then go for it. As long as you do it in a peaceful, respectful way and within the law. But please don't bring Jesus into the fight by carrying a Jesus poster or wearing a a Jesus t-shirt and claiming that you're representing Jesus in this fight. Because in the words of Erwin Lutzer, Jesus didn't come to make ancient Israel. He didn't come to make the United States. He didn't come to make Canada or any other country great again. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost in those nations. He came to transform the hearts of people from the inside out. Yes, our personal and religious freedoms matter. And I pray by God's grace we will not lose them. But we must not make them our primary focus. We must not make them our idol. Or put another way, we must not put our trust in our religious freedoms. But more trust in those than in our Lord and King Jesus. But he, because he is greater and more powerful than anything that concerns us today. I remind you that when Jesus walked the face of this earth, Israel was under the totalitarian rule of Rome. There was little or no freedom And there was a lot of persecution. Folks, we have no idea of what persecution is in this country. The people of that day, particularly followers of Christ, they suffered greatly. Many were imprisoned and executed for their faith. Which is why his disciples and followers wanted him to get political. They wanted Jesus to start an uprising, bring down this oppressive regime called Rome. And given his power, they were convinced he could lead them to victory. 
And yet Jesus said very little about Rome. He did not agitate Rome. He did not lead a movement against Rome. He made no effort to change the system as corrupt as some of it was. There was a lot that needed to be fixed, including human slavery. And what Jesus did say in John 18 is my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus came to start a revolution that would change the world by first changing people's minds and heart, including the hearts of those who created, who maintained, and who profited from the corrupt systems that existed then. Jesus didn't call us to make war with our ungodly culture. He didn't call those who oppose us and, and see us as their enemies. No, he called us to love our enemies. As people embraced him as their living Lord and King, they were changed from the inside out through the power of the Spirit. And in partnership with the Spirit, they began to change the world one life at a time through prayer and again, the work of the Spirit. We know from history, for example, that in less than 300 years after Christ's resurrection and the birth of the early church, less than 300 years, Christians who lived and loved like Jesus were used of God to change the entire ancient world. You know, friends, I genuinely believe that God wants to move. God wants to do a new thing, not only in our church, but across our nation and around the world. And he will do it by first changing hearts through the power of the Spirit, one life at a time. But it will require that we let go of the things that are distracting us or in the words of Hebrews 12, to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and instead that we will invest the time, the talent, and the gifts, the spiritual gifts that God has given to us, the financial resources God has given to us, both directly and indirectly to introduce people to Jesus and help them to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. It's going to require that we hold fast to the truth of God's word and that we get on our knees often and we begin to pray with a renewed passion privately with our families in our missional community groups and together as an entire church. And that in obedience to our Lord Jesus, it's going to require us to stay focused on him and to love our God, to love one another, and to love others to Jesus. And of course, all this will begin with you and me. That's where the change begins. And I just want to declare, as for me, I join Paul in saying, come what may, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I will continue to share the truth of the scriptures, the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ with boldness, and I will make it a high priority in my life because I believe to the core of my being that it is the power of God that brings true life-changing salvation to everyone who believes. And I pray that you too will resolve this in your heart. As I close, I want to say how blessed I am to serve our Lord alongside all of you. How thankful I am for you, our church, for your faithfulness in doing what God calls you to do, for your heart for the lost, for the investment of your time and the abilities that God has given to you, the financial resources he's given to you in the mission and ministry of our church. You are a great encouragement to me. You're a great encouragement to our staff, our board, and perhaps you don't even realize it.
But God is using you. He's living. If he's in you, he's living through you wherever it is you find yourself at work, at school, wherever. You're having an impact on others around you. And you may not even know about it till you get to glory. Know that Jesus sees and that he knows all that you are doing and all that you have done. And one day when it's all said and done, you will be so glad that you gave your life to that which will outlast you. That you were involved in having a part in changing the eternal destiny of people. Would you just bow your heads? Would you just close your eyes for a moment? If you're a follower of Christ, I want to remind you again that Jesus challenges you and me to invest our life in three major priorities. And the first is to love God. To communicate with God in prayer. To hear from him through the scriptures and his promptings. Is there anything that's keeping you from that? Can you name it? What is God calling you to do about it? Jesus also calls us to give our lives to loving one another. If you aren't in community with other Christians, what's holding you back from making it so? Can you name it? What is God asking you to do about that? Is there a friendship that's been fractured because of COVID issues, because of political issues, or perhaps some other issue? What is God calling you to do about that? You see, change begins with us, friends. And then finally, Jesus calls us to love others to Jesus. Who has God laid on your heart to pray for each and every day? To reach out to? Just to serve, to care about them? To introduce them to Jesus? What is their name? Have you written their name down? And what's the next step God is calling you to take in your relationship with them? Thank you, Lord, for being a rock upon which we can stand. Thank you for being a fortress in which we can find hope, peace, and even joy. Thank you for the reminder of what you want us to give our life to and how Satan seeks so hard to mess with it all. Lord, we have heard, and now I pray that you would give us the grace, the power, and all that we need to live, to live out the truth of what we've heard. For I pray it all in the precious name of Jesus. 
Would you please stand? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his precious peace. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you have a prayer need, prayer partners are making their way up here. Love to pray with you about anything that you would love to have prayer for. God bless you.